Okay, welcome to our 29th episode of Bridges of Belonging. My name is Andrea Carey. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I want to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories that I'm coming to you from today, recognizing that we have folks joining us from a variety of areas from across the country. But uh, I'm here on Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasonic territory here on Vancouver Island. And i um, just been very grateful to be here. Uh, in such a safe and welcoming place, even though I'm an uninvited guest here on these territories. Um, I also want to recognize that uh, this morning we received news of some more unmarked graves found here uh, just off Vancouver Island at the uh, Cooper Island Residential School. So just acknowledging the, um, the pain and the loss and how we can kind of figure out how to navigate that as we go forward together. So I am really grateful to welcome our two guests today. We have Cynthia Watson and Ness Murphy joining us, and I'll do an intro to them both in just a minute. Um, I want to begin with a reading, as we normally do. So I'm going to unshare my screen and then share a beautiful book with you. Um, so this is uh, Melinda Gates's book, The Moment of Lift. And I always try and pick a reading that kind of resonates with who our speakers are and um, some of the messaging that I think is probably going to come through in today's conversation. So I'm just going to do this little reading for you. Overcoming the need to create outsiders is our greatest challenge as human beings. It is the key to ending deep inequality. We stigmatize and send to the margins people who trigger in us the feelings we want to avoid. This is why there are so many old and weak and sick and poor people on the margins of society. We tend to push out the people who have qualities we're most afraid of that and that we would find in ourselves. And sometimes we falsely as ascribe qualities we disown to certain groups, then push those groups out as a way of denying those traits in ourselves. This is what drives dominant groups to push different racial, religious and religious groups to the margins. As we are often not honest about what's happening, if we're on the inside and we see someone on the outside, we often say to ourselves, I'm not in that situation because I'm different. But that's just pride talking. We could easily be that person. We have all the things inside of us. We just don't like to confess that we live in common with outsiders because it's too humbling. It suggests that maybe success and failure aren't entirely fair. And if you know you got the better deal, then you have to be humble. And it hurts to give up your sense of superiority and say, I'm no better than others. So instead we invent excuses for our need to exclude. We say it's about merit or tradition when it's really just about protecting our privilege and our pride. Saving lives starts with bringing everyone in. Our societies will be healthiest when we have no outsiders. We should strive for that. We have to keep working to reduce poverty and disease. We have to help outsiders resist the power of people who want to keep them out. We, um, sorry, but we have to do our inner work as well. We have to wake up to the ways we exclude. We have to open our arms and our hearts to the people we've pushed to the margins. It's not enough to help outsiders fight, fight their way in. The real triumph will come when we no longer push anyone out. And uh, I'm sure that Ness will share with us one of their life philosophies. So um, we'll look forward to connecting that, uh, that reading into that as we go forward in today's conversation. Um, I also just want to really welcome Ness and Cynthia and just really appreciate their being here today and uh, looking forward to hearing from them in a deep way. So I'm going to introduce both of them with a brief introduction and then turn it over to each of them to introduce themselves. So Ness Murphy, a breaker of world records, a bearer of metal hardwares, and a holder of world continental and national titles. Um, Ness was born in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, has competed for three countries in three different sports. He's born with a rare congenital condition affecting his vision and uh, has been has had an extensive sporting career and is currently ranked top eight for blind F11 discus in athletics. In 2020, Ness came out publicly as transgender and there's never been an out trans athlete in either the Paralympics or Olympics. So we're currently in a place where we're learning and navigating what that looks like. 
And I look forward to hearing more from Ness and what uh, Ness's journey has been so far and how, uh, how belonging has factored in. So we'll turn over to Ness in a second, but first I want to introduce Cynthia. Cynthia Watson is the Chief Evolution Officer of Vivo for Healthier Generations Society, a charity on a mission to inspire the holistic mindset for healthy living. She loves to tinker, test, and prototype in the realms of social innovation, service design, and social economics to co-create solutions with communities at a systems level. Her lifelong question is to embolden others to make bigger differences in the world. In her parallel universe, she is the co-chair of the Active City Collective, a group of passionate organizations leading a sustained collaborative commitment to citizen well-being through Calgary's emerging active economy sector. She's a graduate of Royal Roads Masters of Arts and Leadership, and uh, I'm just so honored to have both of you here. So Ness, I'm going to turn it over to you to share a little bit more about uh, your journey. Thanks so much, Andrea. It's uh, great to be here. Um, I guess I'll start with saying I like to think of myself as an imperfect human, just trying to be the best I can be, which is going to be constantly changing and evolving. And when I think of myself, I think of myself as a father, a husband, a son. And when I face that challenge of, of going to bio, bios or biographies, I realize I've got all these labels. I'm an athlete, I'm a mental health practitioner, I'm an industrial designer, um, I'm trans, I'm blind. And really what, what speaks for me to me is that I am the sum of my life experiences rather than my labels. And that's something that I really, um, I really try to, to live by and, and help others embrace as well. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there by saying, hi, I'm Ness Murby and I'm imperfect. I love it. Nice to meet you, Ness. Amazing. So vulnerable. What a way to kick us off. <laughs> okay, Cynthia, over to you to do an introduction. You know, I think you, you've done something very magical and syn synchronistic today, Andrea, because I really resonated to the reading um, that you shared and, and very much with what Ness had said. And, you know, this question was about who, who am I? And I've, I've come to a similar place that, you know, who I am is, is not like what I've done and all the experiences that I've have are, are not who I am. So who I am and how I want to show up in the world in terms of bringing everyone in is to be this um, experience of joy and um, of loving kindness. And that's who I am in the world. Well, that's so beautiful. Um, so tell us a little bit, maybe Cynthia, I'll flip it back to you a little bit about your story. Like, how did you arrive in this place of love and kindness? How did you end up um, as the chief evolution officer at Vivo? Tell us a little bit about you and um, on, a, on a deeper level about how you got there. Well, it's interesting. I, I often say from, from a career perspective, I've kind of reverse engineered um, things and, and of course didn't plan it that way because the best things in life are never planned that way. But I actually started out in um, music therapy, working with seniors with palliative care and dementia and really learning about not sweating the big stuff because I also got to sit with people who were taking their last breaths in life and to be able to share what it was like and what, what were the things that they really valued about their life on earth. And it really taught me about, you know, what are your values and are you really focusing your, your energies on what's most important to you and what is fulfilling your purpose. Uh, and from there, I moved from seniors to working at a place called Repsol Sports Center, then it was called Lindsay Park. And uh, that was working with like athletes and Olympians and how, um, Ness, you can probably relate to that, how being best in the world and not best in the world is like one eighth of a second of a second. Um, and, and just what it meant to take about sweating the details and, and, and what it takes to be world-class and to be disciplined and to really focus on, uh, you know, what's uh, mastering your craft and how you want your artistry to show up in the world. Uh, and now kind of in my third decade of my career, it's all about sweating the, the really big stuff, which is about healthier generations and, and how are we looking forward to not be reactive um, but more proactive in what it takes to be conscious in our living choices uh, and to be able to make a contribution to make the world a better place. 
Oh, wow. That's incredible. And uh, I mean, I, one of the things that resonates so strongly with me about you and your leadership is how deeply you connect to your values and how that shows up in every conversation and how you lead and connect with people. And uh, I'm just always so grateful to be in a space with you virtually or in person and to just witness that, uh, that deep connection with values. So thank you for that lovely introduction. Thanks, Andrea. Ness, over to you to share a little bit more about your journey and, uh, you know, Paralympian, three countries, different sports, um, you know, you're also now a new father, like, tell us about how things are going and what this journey has looked like for you. I think, uh, for me, I like to, to look at it as life is good, um, life is hard, and those two can actually be synonymous. Um, Look, 35 years of advocacy and adapting means that I was born into a, um, a, I guess, a life journey, a trajectory that was going to require me to see things from varied perspectives, having a uh, vision that was uh, simultaneously deteriorating and vacillating meant that I could go blind in a second if the sun came out and realizing that that was something hard for other people to comprehend, to empathize with. And for me, that was just a state of baseline of uh, quote unquote normal. And when I think of that um, and going forward in my life, um, I realized that something that I, I continually have faced is people having the, the difficulty to imagine if they haven't experienced. And so in, for me, you know, as you mentioned, I've, I've represented three countries. Um, I, yeah, I, I certainly hold a lot of titles and um, right now I'm focused on, um, you know, mental, mental health and mental health awareness and advocacy. And that's part of being congruent with being a new dad with really wanting to step up and speak out on everyone's value, that there is space for everyone. As, as you so mentioned in the beginning, that's something that I really advocate for is that there's there's space for everyone. There's enough space for all of us. And I see that as my privilege, my, my advocacy, my obstacles, the overcoming is a privilege for me to have a sense, a very strong sense of self. And that's something that I'm, I, I'm seeing being more broadly embraced in the world and something that I'm, I'm hoping that I, I may be able to have some part in facilitating just if somebody you know, one person, one connection sees that it's possible to just be you and that that is enough. That's what I'm aiming for. And, uh, you know, I, I realize that the work that we do, all of us um, do, is something that affects not just ourselves, but it affects our ancestors and our kids. It makes a difference to the way that we proceed. Um, so, yeah, that's you know, a bit of an existential answer, but that's sort of where I'm coming from of, of 36 years of being faced with a lot of no's. And instead of deciding to go, that's okay, going, let's talk about it. What a rich opportunity to talk about it. And uh, we've certainly faced a year and a bit now of um, hard topics and navigating those. So how does talking about it show up for you? What does that look like? For me, it's really important to have the explicit conversations, um, whether we perceive them as positive or negative, um, talking about it gives it a name, which means it actually um, removes some of the power from the conversation. So coming out last year and saying, I'm trans, I've known my entire life that I am a man that I, I wanted at the age of six, I wanted to be a husband and a father. Look at me, 2021, got that down pat, <laughs> got to change. Um, but this idea that needing to actually say these things out loud because otherwise we're expecting people to engage in unspoken agreements um, with unspoken understanding. And so really saying things out loud um, and not, um, not having an expectation on how the conversation should go. And so I come out, I say I'm trans and then what happens next is how I deal with it in the moment. And instead of that thing of, of preempting it or holding back. And I think that makes it possible for us all to have a greater understanding and an empathy for one another 
because if we're all living in a power struggle or some sort of confirmation bias that everyone thinks the way we do, or you know, secondly, you know, opposes what we do, then we're never actually going to give people an opportunity to step up. Mm. Cynthia, I'm so curious as you hear Ness talk about his journey and sharing um, his truth and navigating those conversations and kind of knowing how deeply you live in those values. How does that resonate for you and what, what comes up? Oh, it totally does. Because, you know, when, when you have a title of CEO, people think you have all the answers. But really what I've found most powerfully is like is having the questions, having the curiosity, having the courage to say, I don't know. Um, that's the only way that new things can be born from that space uh, and to, to create the ground for, for truth to grow. So I, I totally resonate with that. Such courage. And, and I really hope that with each generation, like that, that courage becomes just even stronger, that it becomes an, an everyday thing, that it doesn't have to be something that feels so anxiety producing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I totally can understand and appreciate what Ness is saying. I love yeah. that you uh, titles. Um, I think often, or, or rather as time has gone by, we have an expectation of titles that, that you should know because you hold a title. And really, I think something that, that I, I believe has come out of, of COVID is that we have sort of leveled the playing field. You can't show up on Zoom and you know make sure you're sitting at the head of the table and that you, that you hold these, um, these orthodoxy, um, uh, measures of, of status and instead we can be more human and I think as you say the being able to say you don't know is awesome and following it with but let's work it out because that's how we actually move forward if, if we assume we know we're staying stagnant yeah I also loved how you said that you're just you're being present in the moment and responding with that instead of like here's my answer when they say this right uh, yeah also just opens things up for such more richness and vulnerability. Yeah, I was going to echo the vulnerability piece because um, I, I mean, talk about courage and vulnerability, like sharing some of these topics and knowing that or not knowing really what the response is going to be and how that's going to show up or who's, you know, who's going to be supportive, who's going to understand, who's going to connect with you and listen deeply to learn. I think the world operating on a lot of shoulds as well. The should I respond? Should I engage with what this person has shared? Should I share in the first place? And we're spending a lot of time in that um, forward thinking because we're encouraged to, to preempt, to do the chess moves. Um, uh, I'm going to guess. So like, yeah, thinking five moves ahead, it's strategy. And then realizing in life, life constantly changes and we can only control ourselves. So with all those moving parts, we've got to be ready to adapt and to, to sort of step back and just take it all in. I think that's one of the things I really um, kind of loved in COVID was that we actually kind of tossed out a lot of the strategies because none of us had ever planned for this or imagined this. And we had to figure out how we leaned into our values and how we connected with our purpose to drive a lot of the decision making. And I mean, Cynthia, for you, you've been running a facility that has been open, closed, open, closed, different rules every week. <laughs> you know, it's, totally. been a, it's been a total roller coaster ride. So how does that, uh, how does that show up for you in terms of like, you've always led with your values and then in this year really had to deeply connect with that. I, what I appreciated the most is exactly what you said. It, all the distractions kind of fell away because you didn't have the energy resources, you know, time to do it. So what was really important and that really focused on like our most important thing is to be there for the community. Uh, and more now more than ever is when the community needed us there. So yes, we, we do offer things like recreational opportunities. We have social innovation, but what the community needed us for was for pickups for hot meals for people who were in food security issues. It was to, you know, the parking lot was used for people to social distance, you know, in their cars so that they can actually connect with their neighbors and friends. Um, and that was the beautiful part because then the expectations of the platform kind of disappear uh, and then the community begins using the space for what it needs to fulfill its needs. And that was probably the most fulfilling part for us. Is to I love 
that you look at something be, be, being um, gifted with, with the, the idea of COVID. I love that you looked at a car park and went, we can use that for something other than parking cars. And that is, is this idea of opening up to flexibility. You know, instead of looking at something and saying, the rules state that we must interact this way with this or with that person. Um, and that's huge. Um, and yes, yeah, certainly the, the delivering of hot meals, recognizing that bare necessities are the most important when we strip things back. It's not about um, the, you know, the things that we used to place value on. So when we think about that and think about connecting to the community and kind of looking at what people need um, and needed in this last year to be successful, I want to sort of bring it back to each of you and your stories. So Cynthia, maybe I'll lead with you about kind of sharing a time that you felt like you didn't belong and then a time you did belong. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with um, when I felt like I did belong is like oftentimes in my life and maybe even like this too, Ness, that I get these impulse to, to become part of a community or to create community around something. And so uh, when I was in my forties, I decided that I wanted to become a yoga teacher. And so I researched it and I went to, to this yoga class and what, what no one realizes that I'd actually never been to a yoga class before. And <laughs> And here I was going to take teacher training, but I felt drawn to it. I felt like I needed to it. Uh, and the community was incredible. Uh, and it was very welcoming. It was very open. There was a structure that wasn't hierarchical. And it was very much about welcoming and sharing duties and, and being part of that. And so I've really taken that experience with, with me in that. And that a community can really carry you through no matter what your level or ability is uh, to be part of something greater and, and bigger. And that was probably one of the, the biggest ones that I've had. Um, in terms of not belonging, I mean, ironically, I've the times that I haven't belonged is when I've been playing sports because I haven't necessarily been the, the, the star athlete in the, you know, I wanted to be the play basketball and, and whatnot. And I wasn't tall enough or wanted to play volleyball, but my arms weren't strong or my thumbs weren't strong enough. And so um, that's kind of the times when I felt most excluded. But at the same time, it's been the team members that have said, you know, how can, how can we still include her in the sport? Oh, wow. I, uh, I love that story about never doing yoga and then jumping into teacher <laughs> training. Talk about courage and vulnerability. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. But also that resonance around sports and, you know, given that you run a community center where a lot of sport is being delivered, um, you know, how do we look at that and not make it about the strongest and the fittest and the best and actually make it about building belonging? Yes. Well, that's where this, I love this movement around physical literacy and that holistic, you know, mind, body, spirit around, um, you know, how are we building competent and confident children of the future? Yeah. At age, really. And yeah. that isn't necessarily about hitting that 1% in the, in the world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Building, Not building that there's anything wrong with that, Ness. <laughs> oh, no, I, I you, you know, I'm not needing to speak up because you're actually like um, uh, speaking on, on all my values. I mean, I've been number one in the world and nobody knew my name. And that's where I recognize like that's because you don't need to be defined by being that one percent. And I I really um, was touched by um, you speaking on that concept of being enough is what I'm hearing um, when you speak on um, deciding that you wanted to be a yoga instructor you're enough to be a yoga instructor. I mean, when, when we, we kind of laugh in the, oh, but you'd never done it before. Well, everyone, when you start something, you've never done it before. And so I love that you grabbed that. And then when you speak on actually um, being involved in sports, um, I, what I hear is the shift to, well, now the playbook is telling me that I'm not enough because I don't fit into this physicality or, or this, um, this visual and really at the end of the day um it doesn't matter if you fit that picture because you're enough it comes from within you and whether you're the top one percent or in the 99th percentile um it's it's not about a rank because then we refer back to labels and 
yeah, I'm going to throw in, I, I know I'm just shifting away from the personal, but a quick anecdote of, um, I met someone at um, the Rio Paralympic celebratory Ottawa dinner function, who is now a coach who had been an athlete. And he actually shared with me that he was told he couldn't be a hurdler. He's like, but all I want to do is be a hurdler. Like, no, nah, sorry, you're just not tall enough. You, you can't be a hurdler. And he went, but, but I can. And they're like, you'll never make the times. You'll never jump over. He went, I don't need to jump over. I'll go straight through them. And he did. And he made the team. And so, and that's where you go cognitive flexibility. And it's exciting because just because somebody says so doesn't make it so. And so I love that you have grabbed hold of you are enough and redefining what enough is. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. Let's just run through the hurdles. Let's just read my sport. <laughs> There's the end. What's the end game, right? <laughs> According to the rules, that that's legal. So I mean, yep, we want to talk playbooks. Okay. Yep. <laughs> So Ness, I am going to come back to you to yep. share your journey of not belonging and belonging. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with not belonging. And um, it's really interesting. I haven't spoken on this particular story much because I realized it came with the stigma of being unpatriotic, um, or at least that's how it felt to me. And then processing through it, I realized no, actually it is the very definition of being patriotic. So there's the setup. Um, my not belonging um, goes back to 2012 and I had immigrated to Canada and I was uh, applying for my citizenship and to do so you have to get a medical exam. So um, my wife then fiance, um, we went to the building, we sat in the waiting room and when I was called up, they said I had to go in alone. Um, so no problem, I get in there. And this, um, this medical expert does all my, my physical, I'm looking great, and then asks me pointedly, so how much vision do you have? I said, well, none, you know, but uh, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I'm actually here to, you know, hopefully represent Canada. You know, I've done this, done that, I'm excited. And his response was, hmm. We don't let drains on society like you into our country, but since you are applying through the family class, I have no choice. And I went, oh, you know, sort of like the, the way that I respond to that, um, you know, in terms of a whole body feel is like, that's okay. Um, we'll get through that. You know, those years of um, adapting um, on the outside was just silence for me. I leave the room, I make sure I don't tell my fiance straight away. Um, <laughs> and that's something that I recognized I'd faced a lot in my life to that point. I'm, I'm used to people saying no, um, but for some reason that has specifically stuck with me as a, well, you actually told me a whole country didn't want me. And that was heavy. Now, the reason I say it's also very patriotic of me to speak up about it now is this notion of he didn't speak for the entire country. And that's part of this messaging of realizing when we speak, our words have power, but we also need to remember that nobody is speaking for anyone other than themselves. So that was this instance of not belonging. Um, and then my instance of actually feeling like I really belonged came about unexpectedly. Um, and I was about seven, uh, my family and I'd moved to Hong Kong and we went to go pick up school uniforms and the chap there said to my mother, ah, okay, so what size uniform does your son need? And there was this moment where I went, wow, I belong, I've been seen, I'm going to a co-ed school, I could pull this off, I can, you know, like, in this moment, until my, my mother corrected, mis <laughs> misgendered me at the time, you know, um, and, and we changed uniforms. But what I realized taking from that is belonging isn't necessarily something that we even are aware that we're seeking. And so sometimes it can be gifted to us and it's about a recognition of ourselves and how we feel about ourselves. Wow, 
Those are tremendous stories. Thank you for both of those. Um, I always really appreciate your perspective and wisdom as you, uh, you know, you're framing around recognizing that that medical professional, you know, was speaking for themselves and not for the country, despite I'm sure the kind of hurt and pain you were experiencing uh, through that process. But then also, um, yeah, that just feeling seen and understood by that individual at such a young age. I am, uh, it, it piques my curiosity around sort of as your mother misgendered you, sort of how that resonated with you and what that family experience has been like, but you, you can change the subject if you want. <laughs> Let me know if I'm digging too deep. <laughs> um. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, you know, it, it puts me in, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, but that's not a bad space to be in. Um, I think I've been lucky that uh, my whole life, I've been Ness, I've been very supported by uh, my grandmother who understood that I should have been born a boy. I think my mother um, struggled more with it in terms of accepting me for being me, but struggling with the dissonance of what society was telling her she needed to do as as a mother. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm taking a moment because I'm like, all right, that that is it is a bit of a clench. It is a bit hard. And going, I know that my mother loves me the best she can, and that has been something I've known my entire life. Is it always in the way that I want? No. And so, yeah, there is my mother wholeheartedly accepts me and yet at the same time really doesn't comprehend or engage with the fact that I'm trans and so that's two truths and that's the wonderful thing about life it's it's not hard and fast it's not black and white it's not polarized it's a wonderful gray zone and I feel privileged to be able to recognize that gray zone it really does remove a lot of the suffering so yeah it felt you know it was like almost a betrayal when when mum's like no 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 we've got to do that and um and on the other hand um knowing that she was completely okay with me wanting to play with all the boys so you know it's it's a mix right life uh, licorice all sorts <laughs> <laughs> oh amazing amazing um so i'm gonna go back to cynthia um to what extent do you feel like you belong to yourself and what is that journey and sort of figuring that piece out for you looked like? Um, you know, again, listening to Nessa kind of tweaks something for me is that I had what I call my Oprah moment when I was in my thirties. I remember like standing in a, like a Safeway store, get paying for my groceries. And there was this mag Oprah magazine and it said, are you listening to your life? And it, it was kind of like one of those koans that kind of like, what does that mean? Like, and then I realized at that point, I didn't even know what my voice sounded like. I could hear my mother's voice. I could hear, you know, other society's voice or what I should be doing, but I didn't actually know what the sound of my own voice was. And, and that really started that journey of um, having the courage to speak outside of the other voices that I was kind of listening to in my head. And that started my sense of belonging to myself, is listening to myself and honoring that voice. Mm, that's awesome. I often reflect like, wow, if I knew in my teens and 20s what I know now, like how different and how rich could that be, right? You, uh, you kind of spend all this time trying to figure out some of these core life lessons. And then when they land, it's like game changer. Yeah, awesome. Um, Ness, what about you? belonging to yourself navigating that piece yeah. um I think what's interesting is how it develops over time and so um I like that that recognition of who's who's the voice inside inside yourself and and where is it coming from and, and how do our values um develop and, and and mold and shift away from those which we have adopted from the important people in our lives. Um, I think for me, I was lucky enough, my, my, my grandparents um, really, um, I, I have one set of grandparents paternal side and um, I was lucky enough that they really instilled in me that just 
be yourself. And, and it's really important that you stand up for what you believe in. What was really hard and, and has taken me most of my life to, to reconcile, um, because I haven't always been this cool guy, like, you know, like the whole athlete jock shades. I mean, just, ugh. I was a loner. Um, people didn't particularly um, resonate um, to my fields of interest, uh, to, to what I had to say. And, and learning that belonging isn't defined by the number of people around you. I feel it's more defined by how congruent you are with your values and that people people will come and go and and there are learning experiences with that but it's really important that the place that you belong is with yourself oh my gosh belonging i'm just going to say that back belonging is defined by the congruence to your values mm, so beautiful um, so Ness, I'm going to stay with you, you know, you've spent a good chunk of your life kind of navigating spaces, navigating systems, structures that have really been set up to exclude. And, you know, with the different intersections of your identity, probably even more so in terms of some of the ways you've had to navigate the world. What do you feel needs to change in order to create spaces of belonging for each person? Um, I think the operative word here is change. Um, you know, change actually needs to, to happen and be enacted. Um, whilst I think speaking up and visibility is really important, it shouldn't be reliant upon that. Um, we shouldn't have to justify why we have value in society, that, that why we need to define our intersectionality. Uh, do I really need to uh, point out that, um, I've got, uh, you know, disability, um, transgender, and and race um, in my intersections. Um, or is this a case where we can all just settle on that we're human and we can grow from one another? So what needs to change, I believe, is stop telling ourselves that the system is working. It might have worked, but that doesn't mean that it was always working. And as humans, we are designed to change. We are designed to grow and applying a old system that we you know, cognitively uh, distorted to believe was perfect is always going to become imperfect. And so in doing that, we need to start changing our processes, listening to how the world is speaking, how individuals are speaking. And I think most importantly, validating everyone's experience. We don't have to agree, but validating an individual, we are all equal. And what people have to contribute is just as valuable, whether we agree with it or not. And um, one of the, uh, I think the most important things at the end of the day is stop standing in people's way. Stop being that obstacle out of, our, out of your own projected fear of change, your own projected sense of rigidity, um, you, you know, even your own projected values, we just need to stop standing in other people's way and enact real change to grow. We're all needing to, um, yeah, I, I think it stems back to there is enough space for all of us and we don't all fit in a box. We're just not designed. Ness, how do you um, help people get out of their blind spot? Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the pun. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, I tell them to get a really cute guide dog. No. <laughs> that helps. It actually, you know, as, as much as I jump on that pun, um, un unfortunately, people like things that are palatable. So, you know, the guide dog, you know, always stops the conversation. But, um, you know, we're actually talking the nitty gritty. It's instead of looking at a situation and going, there's one way there's this or that, I challenge people, come up with three to five because there are always three to five choices. So the first thing you've got to do is stop looking at the world like there is a right and a wrong of this way or that way. There's everything in between. And I think when we, when we do that, we start to, to open up 
um, the idea that there that there's possibility. And then the second thing I, I gen to, tend to pose to people is ask yourself, at what cost? At what cost are you remaining the same? And at what cost is this change? And that's really important because often um, I find that uh, the way the way society is set up is just assuming that staying the same is the better choice and it doesn't have a trade-off, but there are always trade-offs. So knowing who you are now, what would you say to that medical professional? How would you handle that conversation now? I'd love to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> a few choice words. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, it would be really important to, to stop and say, what does disability mean to you? What does being a drain on society mean to you? And how do you see me fitting in that? Because it's really important as well when we have these conversations to, to recognize a lot of the times people are projecting their fear of something onto the other person. And that's about that, that um, privileged, um, not wanting to go there. Um, so disability with my intersections, disability is one that, that people recognize, um, society studies have been done, uh, that it's recognized that we could all wind up disabled. And I think that it's really important then to start unpacking why, you know, why do you think I'm a drain would be the first question. And I think that opens up a conversation rather than me sort of taking it as that was just fact, that was his statement. I think it comes from a, a baseline of being uninformed. Nice. Yeah, I often try and begin with people don't know what they don't know and how can we support them to know. And lately I've had a couple of experiences. I'm like, and some people are just mean. <laughs> so there's also balancing that off. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a concept of persistence and perseverance that's important. And then also knowing when to, to, to have that conversation of, is this serving me? So certainly as coming out as transgender um, has led to a, a lot of those um, uh, conflicts, uh, conversations, um, and facing a lot of rigidity. And I, I think that's where I've seen the most um, pushback from people. And so, yes, sort of going, how long do I persist on this road of trying to, to create just some breathing room um, when I know it, it serves everyone for us to be flexible, but am I, am I getting anything from this in the sense of, is it serving me? Is it serving my values and my purpose? Yeah, such a powerful question. Um, so I want to move to Cynthia and ask a question around, you know, you've been leading Vivo, you're leaving, leading really incredible work across Calgary that's really about like supporting people in spaces and places and, um, and so, and through programs and services. So what do you focus on in that work and what change are you trying to facilitate through all of that work? Well, Andrea, you know that I've been learning from you for a number of years now. And so uh, I think you were the one that first introduced me to that phrase, not, not about me without me. Mm -hmm. And that has really been part of the mantra. Even when we were designing the new facility, the question was who was not coming to places like Vivo and why? Engaging those them in the conversation and helping co-design what those spaces and places will be. So that um, in the end, when, when the expansion is finally done, it, it's not about Vivo welcoming the community in, it's about how is the community welcoming itself in, that it's their space and their place of belonging. Um, and then I also had a recent conversation with Claire Bure from the Mars District in, uh, in Toronto, that's a social innovation group. Um, and we were having this amazing conversation about how diversity, inclusion, and sense of belonging absolutely needs to be baked into everything that we do if what we do is to be of any use. So if we're going to be making any forward motion in the world as a, as a humanity, um, it needs to be part of what we do. Yeah, I love that you um, bring up 
that, you know, the, the concept of who's not coming. And then also, if it's going to be a part of it, then it needs to be a conscious part of it. I think, um, you know, part of the work that, that I've also started with um, is the needing to call people out on bad behavior. And it's an uncomfortable position to be in because it creates an unusual power dynamic. But if we get rid of the power dynamic, then we really can call people out on bad behavior because it's not about the person, it's about the behavior. So when you talk about um, why aren't people coming and potentially there, there's a behavioral um, uh, orthodoxy that is going on that's not creating a sense of belonging or welcoming. Yeah, another great one, Ness. Thank you for that. <laughs> I know, um, Ness, in the chat, there's been a series of uh, comments around, um, I'm going to be rewatching this a few times. Wow, some powerful messages. Um, I've never thought of finding peace and joy in the gray zone of life, but that's one of my takeaways from today. Uh, so powerful, 100% agreement in uh, a comment you just made. So yeah, lot, lots of comments uh, just really resonating in terms of what you've been sharing today. So I just wanted to flag that and recognize that. So thank you for those. I'm also taking notes because we'll uh, we'll send this out after and share it with our audience and um, some of those pieces that are really resonating as takeaways. Thank you for that. As a as a blinky, I, I the multitasking. If I'm trying to stay present, I I don't uh, necessarily catch all the chat with voiceover. So uh, it's good to know that uh, speaking out into that very black void um, to get. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, all good. And um, yeah, I kind of feel like we need Nest T-shirts with all some of these. Cool <laughs> right I'll back at you. Yeah. Seriously, <laughs> you, you don't need to have done something to start doing it. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um we just got another message in the chat so i oh and somebody wants See, to buy i'll one. buy one <laughs> <laughs> me too <laughs> so one of the messages we just got was i completely agree with karen and jessica such powerful messages from both Ness and cynthia and i'm so grateful to be learning from both of them today thank you to andrea for bringing us all together this afternoon and thank you Ness and cynthia for your honesty and vulnerability today mm. So we are heading towards the end of our time together. I would love to ask you one more question, then we'll kind of maybe move to wrap up. Um, so my last question is, what do you think we need to do to facilitate belonging for everyone? So who wants to lead on that? Well, I think for me, it's, it's about making sure those voices are at the table. And it, we need to have more people in leadership positions. This is not a, we're, we're ditching the colonial view that we know more, we know better. Um, it, it needs to be more that generational view of how we're making decisions for the next generations that are coming um, and having a more inclusive voice at the table. Mm. Not the token voices, the real voices. Yeah, I uh, wholeheartedly agree. And I think um, there needs to be um, less of an apathetic approach to getting those people to the table, to, to amplifying people's voices. We need to drop the ego and, and stop having that privilege approach of there's nothing I can do. Um, yeah. If you're authentically wanting to, to grow and improve things, then you need to be proactive in doing it. And that involves change in action. And so when we're inviting people, we need to do it authentically. You know, it's, it's a case of don't just say, does anyone have any suggestions? And then it being just this hollow, the bottom falls out. Um, you know, if we're, we're talking for a hard and fast change, invite conversation. And when there's silence, because remember, we're talking about a safe space and a trust. Trust, I guess, requires us to also be vulnerable if, if we're asking for it. There has to be a, a joint participation. And so there's this idea of an expectation for an immediate call for, these things need to be changed. But if we've followed through with a playbook that says it's not safe to speak up, it's not safe to, to have your, your voice out there, you certainly won't be heard, um, some of these narratives, then we need to actually work just as hard to convince people of the opposite. And I think a lot of the times the people who are in the position of power to, to um, implement change step back from it going nothing I can do. 
And instead, they should be moving towards it, leaning into it and offering that vulnerability right back to the beginning. I don't know, but I can find out. We'll find it out together. We'll work it out. I want to know. I want to hear the bad, the good, the ugly, and all the gray spaces. Um, we do have one question that just popped up from Andrea McDonald. What is the recommendation for dealing with those that are resisting? That's a really good question. I think, you know, it sounds like a, a politician's answer. It entirely depends on the situation. <laughs> um, but my, my approach often um, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, after drinking the bottle of gin, um, <laughs> <laughs> then taking that breath. And then actually, um, I tend to try to insist on conversation, um, asking questions, um, you know, forcing, inviting um, the person who is resisting to share the why behind. Because if you go at someone who's resisting with a, you're wrong, things need to change, you're going to get just as much pushback. And instead, if you in, invite that conversation of, well, tell me how it works in your situation. And I understand that potentially this approach sounds somewhat idealistic. I found that I'm surprised how far I can often get with doing this. And it may not get to the end point that I wanted that outcome. Um, you know, the, the, the be all and end all of there was change immediately. <laughs> But what I have found is a lot of change happens that maybe I don't find out about for quite some distance down the road. And whilst it's a hard burden to carry, there is this thing of knowing that you are doing something that is inviting, that is active rather than reactive, and you're setting an example. And that example helps others find the words, find the voice to do the same thing, to push for that same example against the resistance. Mm -hmm. I I had like an ABCs. Trust me, society works really well on the ABCs one, two, three. It just never seemed to happen. In 35 years, I can tell you, never had the same response from one person. I agree. It's a bit of like a martial arts view, right? Like it's like it's you go from a yes but to a yes and, and you kind of work with the energy until it moves on itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and encapsulates it and becomes part of the whole. But it takes effort to do that. And I mean, that whole empathy thing when it's the last thing you want to be, but to be, to be in that listening mode, to really listen to where people are coming from. Well, and like you say, they either have the closed mindset or the growth mindset too. And you can't always be up against that stone. And it's really important not to sort of go in and be like, you're closed, therefore not yeah. work. Um, and I think that, you know, that's part of the, the advocacy fatigue really being aware of where your boundaries are that allow you to flex, to work with people. And then when you know that it's, it's becoming to, the, the balance is getting out of check and you need to sort of step back from it and say, okay, because we're humans, we can revisit. There's no, like, you, you, you can put a book back on the shelf and read it again. So, you know, taking that time to step out of it, maybe, you know, whether it's the bottle of gin or a really nice walk outside, <laughs> And then either come back or recognize that it's something that you don't need to, to tap into now, but there are other avenues. And I think that that's really important when the word resistance, I just, I wanted to make sure that I'm not sort of setting people up as if I have all this power, setting people up for the Armageddon of like viva la inclusion, diversity, equity, and justice. We, it, it is that movement, but that movement can be very calm and can be grounded and it doesn't require you to give of yourself more than you have to give. Because um, I think even how you are showing up, it's just like when you are that comfortable in who you are and you know you're not going away and that in itself is like, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> we can have this conversation again later. <laughs> yeah, so powerful. Oh my gosh, I feel like uh, both of you should be actually examples in the coaching program I just finished a row <laughs> It's like, these are all themes we talked about, but you just brought it to life so beautifully. And uh, I definitely would love to have each of you on one of my arms going into some of the hard conversations that I feel like we're navigating. 
You know what's beautiful about that is what you've just told me is that it's happening elsewhere. So yes. whilst I'm excited that you just said, you know, you guys should be there, um, that, that you're actually seeing that from others, that, that's the amazing stuff. That's the growth. That's the, the change that's happening. Yeah. All these journeys we're navigating. So I'm going to give you each sort of a minute to give some wrap up thoughts and comments about today's conversation, anything that sort of resonated with you or you want to share back to the audience as a takeaway. Wow. <laughs> I want I want to thank Massive Nessa. Massive task in a minute or less. No. Yes, for, for sharing. And and Ness, I think because you showed up so so clearly and so courageously, I felt like I could go there too. And so I truly appreciate that. And and Andrea also for opening in and creating that safe space. Um, I didn't feel like I needed to be business Cynthia today. I just felt like I could be me. And I, I truly appreciate that opportunity. Thank you. Well, that was very short, Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, one of the beauties of this com these conversations for me has been that, you know, many of the people that have been guests on it, I know through a work sense or we've done work together in some way, but I feel like so rarely do we actually get to have conversations about who we are as people and how we're showing up mm -hmm. in the world without sort of our title and role attached. So... Um, yeah, thanks for that. Next. I want to second and third that, um, that having the, the two of you present and speaking so openly makes it a more comfortable space. Um, you know, when you're doing one-on-ones, it, it certainly feels like the burden is on your shoulders to make sure you're saying the right thing because mm. you're speaking out as that one voice that's going to, you know, um, have to carry that load. And so this environment, I really appreciate both of your vulnerability, your openness, your honesty. Um, that makes a huge difference. And it certainly does create a conversation. To the audience, I think, um, I would say thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you for, for participating and, and, and being willing to be open to this. Um, my final thought, I know I'm taking up all the rest of your guys' 60 seconds, um, but my final thought is something that is, um, came up yesterday. I was once asked recently, if you know, I, I'm a trailblazer. Do I see myself as a trailblazer? Um, how, do I, how do I feel about speaking up and, and being this, this person to look to? And in honesty, when I came out last year as transgender, I did not want to um, pursue a life of the spotlight and advocacy, not because I wouldn't be fighting, but because I didn't want to be that person in that limelight I'm, I'm just not that person even though I seem to be in that situation a lot and what I came to realize is we all are we all carry that burden and we all share that burden because if we don't do it someone else is doing it and so I just want to like say thank you to everyone who's shown up here because you are all carrying this burden with me with us and that is really important to remember that we are not alone and we are creating a space where people can look out and say, I think I can speak because there's somebody else there who's already speaking. So thank mm -hmm. you all. Beautiful. Yeah, and we had, uh, you know, I've, we've heard that so many times, I would say, over some of these conversations where it's like, you know, so-and-so spoke up and they created a space for me to then be able to step into that. And so just want to really acknowledge both of you for being trailblazers and creating paths that others feel comfortable then to be a part of and creating the safety for some of these conversations that haven't been had but really desperately need to be had in order for people to feel um, and find their path to belonging. So thank you each. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and we've had some really lovely comments in the chat. Uh, one person said, I'm open, more open and aware now. Thanks for sharing your stories and vulnerability. So many takeaways, some key ones, remembering no one is speaking for another other than themselves and having explicit converse, uh, conversations as unspoken agreements have unspoken understandings. Assumptions take away opportunity to have conversations, continuing to learn and unlearn. 
and uh, what a pleasure it's been. So I want to echo that. It's been such a pleasure to have this time with both of you. I have so much uh, respect and admiration for each of you, and uh, it's just been an honor to have you as guests on our 29th episode of Bridges of Belonging. So thank you for saying yes. Um, thank you. I also want to acknowledge um, we do a donation each time to our, uh, acknowledge our guest contribution. So we're uh, donating to EGAL Canada this month. And Thank you. Uh, yeah, so just appreciating each being here and the work that EGAL does to uh, share gender inclusion resources and tools across the country. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just going to pop up our next session for Bridges of Belonging is coming up on uh, August uh, 16th, which is a Monday. We don't usually do Mondays, but this seemed to land this time. And we're going to have two guests from Punjabi Night in uh, Hockey Night in Canada, Randeep Janda and Amrit Gill. And uh, really looking forward to hearing from them and their journeys in uh, our hockey crazed nation and uh, what that's looked like to bring a totally different perspective and language to that work. So um, thank you again to Ness and Cynthia and to each of those uh, that attended today and take care and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>